Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon and good morning and good evening to all our friends in and around the world uh, who have patched in today on our webinar, the Rogers Ready webinar, which will be um, on YouTube at the end of today's event. Welcome, my name is Brent Morgan. I am a director of Rogers Ready Melbourne, Victoria. Once the world's most livable city, Unfortunately, I don't know if we can claim that at the moment, but we'll get to that a little bit later. I'm speaking to you from my, my daughter's bedroom, as most people will be speaking. They'll be speaking from their um, bedrooms, they'll be speaking from their kitchen benches, they'll be speaking from the offices if they're lucky enough. But we're during COVID times, it's a lot of people in Australia are operating from home at the moment. And in Victoria, we're in a hard lockdown. So unfortunately, we're not allowed to go anywhere. Who is Rogers Reedy? Well, Rogers Reedy, for a lot of you, will be quite well aware of who we are, but for some of our friends who are overseas, um, we are one of the leading insolvency and turnaround firms in Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. Um, we are the only Australian firm to have offices in all of the Australian states and territories. I'm very proud of that. We're also a founding member of the BTG Global Advisory Group with over 100 partners and 60 offices worldwide. And BTG Global Advisory specialises in insolvency and turnaround. Today we have uh, over 400 subscribers. So you are one of 400 people listening in today. We're very, very proud to have so many people listening in and hearing what our partners around the world uh, are to say. And what are we going to speak about today? Well, we're going to speak about, we're going to do a scattergun approach um, about um, COVID and its impact on businesses throughout the world. We're going to give you short, sharp um, information. It's not going to be too in depth. We only have an hour today. We have a lot of people to speak to and a lot of countries to go around. Um, but we're going to speak about specific industries that have been impacted and specific um, industries that have benefited from the COVID um, pandemic. We're going to talk about how governments have reacted um, through legislation and also through support packages in different jurisdictions around the world. We are very blessed today, and I'm, I must say I was speaking to these two people, we're blessed to have um, some of the world's most respected insolvency and turnaround specialists from North America, um, in Ian Ratten, Ratner and Alan Nakin, who are shortly going to speak to us. So they, they're, we're very blessed to have them from our BTG group talking to all our friends um, around the world. Apologies up front, if we have any technical issues, as I said, um, we are operating these in bedrooms and, and, um, and, and kitchen benches. You might see a cat or two walk past people's screens. We do apologise up front, but um, you know, this is the new world of living and working from home. Let's get straight into it. Um, Ian Ratner. Ian Ratner is uh, a partner at Glass Ratner in the USA. He's a, he's a founding member of the BTG group. Um, Glass Ratner is uh, just changed his name yesterday to be Riley Advisory Services. 32 years of experience. Um, he has done some large insolvency turnarounds in the USA. Uh, and once you see him, you'll be surprised like I am that he's a grandfather, um, but he's going to speak to, to to us today about the USA perspective. He might even um, talk about the USA election, which we're probably all watching from afar. Uh, the polls are saying Biden. Ian, you're patching in. It's, it's 10 o'clock at night in the US. You're, you're in Atlanta. Good evening. Uh, I am, and I'm delighted to be here and uh, participate in this uh, phenomenal program. So, so, Ian, before you go on, the polls are saying Biden. In 2016, they said Clinton by a landslide. Um, so it's not over until the, until the day. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the I think that's the reality. It's not over. Uh, it's not over till the day. Uh, some would say that uh, Biden has a benefit because he's basically been having limited campaigning, and uh, and our current our our current president, you know, uh, does everything possible to uh, tarnish his image on a daily basis. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting, and I think uh, the uncertainty. 
I think there's a little feedback, uh, Brent, but um, the uncertainty that the election is creating uh, is also, um, you know, making the economic situation in the U.S. more difficult. So I think it's it's uh, it's adding to the it's adding to the situation here. You know, we uh, we're going to talk a little bit about hotels and um, part of our part of the problem in the tourism business and the hotel space is also tied to social unrest. And if you read some of the public filings for some of the hotel companies, they're actually calling out uh, COVID as uh, impacting their business and also calling out the uh, social unrest that we're seeing across the United States, um, which is impacting the economy and um, uh, in a broad way. But um, I, I have a very uh, short uh, time. I want to respect the, get, the, the session. So I figure I'm going to talk about three things uh, very quickly. I'm going to cover a couple of key industries and give you a flavor for what's going on in the United States in those industries. And uh, then I'm going to uh, just comment on not, there's, there are winners and losers in COVID. And even within an industry, it's not necessarily the entire industry. And then finally, I'm just going to touch on the uh, monumental amount of money that the government has put into the system and what we call the government response. And then uh, just, you know, where do we go from here? So just out of the gate, uh, the, I'm sure tonight everybody's going to cover the same types of industries, uh, you know, retail, shopping centers, commercial real estate, um, hotels, 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 hospitality, restaurants. And then ultimately, further down the cycle here, we're going to have a major correction in um, the office market and uh, the amount of office uh, loans and Siri, you know, and, and, and commercial back mortgage securities that are going to be in default on the office space. So I think those are the big industries. I'll just give you a, a, in the retail space, this is just since March, okay? You're talking about companies like, that you, that you may have heard of, like Art Van uh, Furniture, True Religion, Roots USA, J. Crew, Neiman Marcus, Aldo Shoes, Stage Stores, JC Penney, uh, Tuesday Morning, GNC, Lucky Brand, G Star, Brooks Brothers, um, RTW uh, retail wins, uh, the paper stores, which, you know, some of these cases we've been in, uh, Lord and Taylor, Taylor brand, Steinmart, and like yesterday, century 21 filed. You're talking about thousands of stores, um, that are going to be, um, uh, liquidated and, um, and, you know, people out of their, out of jobs and, you know, losses, um, to unsecured creditors. And in many cases, secured lenders, investors, uh, private equity owners. Many of these retail chains are highly levered, and that leverage is hard to um, manage in this situation. I want to touch on another industry um, where we talked about shopping centers. Even recently, you've seen some pretty big portfolios that are going back to um, going back to uh, the lenders, and that's because people are uh, foreseeing that they have very little opportunity to work their way out in the uh, short and medium term. I want to give you another statistic that is mind numbing. I just looked this up today. Um, everybody uh, in the market is familiar with our very um, uh, uh, large CMBS market, which is com commercial backed mortgage security market, which is kind of a non recourse um, methodology for companies to borrow, primarily real estate related. And um, in the first half of 2020, Remember, the first couple of months where the economy was fine, so it's really Q2. But in the first half of 2020, um, $12.1 billion of loans have gone into default. That's about 536 loans, and it's about 50-50 hotels and um, commercial real estate. And I just want to compare that number to the first half of 2019. So period to period, same period, um, it's 10x. Last year for the first six months, the uh, number of loans that were in default was 1.2 billion. So I, I just mentioned it's 12 billion, so it's 10x. And really things are just starting. Um, you know, for example, I'm in a deal right now, it's a hotel deal that it's CMBS financed. Uh, we're watching it through different sources and the, the property is definitely in distress, but there has been no uh, payment default yet. 
the, the equity owners have been able to keep current. But it is um, a CMBS loan and it, it, it is in a CMBS pool. And ultimately, so those numbers are pretty uh, mind numbing. The hotel space is, is in rough space. I'm working uh, for a, a company today that has uh, eight hotels. One of the hotels has 1,300 rooms and they've been 7% occupied um, since um, February. Um, so, and uh, what this client tells me is it's not only Corona, the social unrest in the United States is also um, adding fuel to the fire in terms of convention hotels and hotels that are in inner city markets um, uh, that, that are being subject to the pretty widespread unrest in the United States. Um, I, so of course, I, ultimately, I think we're going to get to commercial large uh, rental real estate, but we're not there yet. Okay. If you think of LA, New York, Chicago, a lot of these massive towers are highly levered. And as rent contracts are coming due and leases, you're going to see people are going to take less space. They're going to box up their desks and say, look, we're not going back into the office until next year. We don't need a lease or we're going to get a smaller space. That's going to affect the um, office market in, in a great degree. So not everybody is a loser in COVID. Um, you know, there are, there are businesses that are doing well. I have a client that is a major lighting manufacturer and lighting retailer. And they have stores and they sell online and their business is up 20%. Um, everybody in the home renovation business, in the home space, contractors, labor, you cannot get labor out to your house. So there's been a absolute resurgence in the um, home renovation business. Uh, home builders are, are, are going crazy. And in fact, real estate businesses, the residential real estate business is very strong right now. A lot of relocation, people are moving from the cities to the suburbs. There's just a lot of activity. Um, and there's been certain retailers that have been on the uh, more forefront. The older retailers are suffering. Some of the newer retailers like Target that have been more on the cutting edge are doing terrific. Um, just quickly, I, I want to respect the time. I want to just touch on the government response because I think it's difficult to get a sense of the, the magnitude of the United States um, when you're not here. I'm originally from Canada, so I'm always in awe. I've been in the U.S. for um, close to 30 years, 25 years, but I'm still in awe of the size of things. And I just want to give you a, a couple of numbers. The amount of money that has come into the economy through various government stimulus programs, uh, both direct to business and direct to consumers, um, is about $2.4 trillion. That is larger than the GDP of Italy or France or Spain. So when you, th and that's GDP. So when you think about the amount of money that the government has made available through, um, and I'm gonna talk about one program that's been very successful. It's really mind numbing. There's been enhanced unemployment insurance benefits. There's been supplemental uninsurance uh, benefits. There's been uh, uh, lending programs for large corporations. There's in industry bailouts in healthcare and in, in, in airlines. And then finally, one program, which I think you have the, um, uh, Brent uh, said what it is, and he'll say it in, in what your program is. JobKeeper. Wait, JobKeeper job in Australia. Keeper. Yeah. Uh, JobKeeper makes sense. In America, nothing makes sense. It's called the PPP program. But basically, this was a way for uh, companies to borrow money to cover payroll. And the idea was that if you kept your employees, the government would help fund that payroll for three months, uh, two and a half months, actually. And just in that program alone, the, there's been two tranches of funding. Uh, the, first, the first tranche was $349 billion, and it was tapped into very quickly. And the second tranche was $310 billion. So you have uh, you know, under $700 billion went into a program that was limited to companies that are under 500 employees, and it was limited to two, month, two and a half months of payroll. Most of that money will end up being um, forgiven uh, as long as companies maintain certain employment um, statistics. So um, uh, just tie this back to the politics a little bit. Um, notwithstanding uh, our president's um, unfavorable rating, I do believe that his business background and his 
kind of bravado, um, he, w he was fast to move. And there was a lot of money made available, piled into the economy. Look, things are dreadful in the United States, but they would be substantially worse without the actions that were taken. And I, I believe that uh, because he's a business person, he, he did pile a lot of money in. So I think I'll turn it back to Brent, but I think we've got a long way, long way to go in the United States. Ian, thank you. I mean, if, if, if Mr. Trump would tweet on those sort of stats, I, I think it would go a long way rather than him talking about the sort of stuff that he does tweet on. Thank you. And we'll come back. We've already had a number of questions um, that, that have been put to you. So please stay up a little bit longer. I know it's late there, but we're going to move to your northern neighbour. Um, we're going to go to Canada, the home of hockey, ice hockey and, and maple syrup and Justin Bieber. Um, you know, one of, one of my favourites. Um, and uh, we've got Alan Nakin, who is a well-respected Canadian um, practitioner. He's only the one of seven um, insolvency, INSOL, the International Insolvency Network um, fellows. So that shows, um, that, you know, the respect that people have for Alan. Um, he's worked on a lot of Canadian uh, restructures and he's one of the co-founders of Farber's um, um, Insolvency Practice in Canada. So. Good evening, Alan. Um, are we, have we, you haven't dozed off the bed, you, you're there? No, I'm, I'm still good. Thanks so much, Brent, and I really appreciate being involved in this tonight, uh, tomorrow for you guys. Um, so it's, it struck me being an ex-South African and with so many people from Australia and New Zealand, everybody would probably prefer to be speaking about rugby, uh, but, but we find ourselves in this in this global predicament and then we're all facing the same challenges and many of the same solutions which is i think a theme that will come through uh, on, on the call uh, so I, I will say as a canadian we've handled the health crisis very well uh, we've done a very good job of keeping the, the curve flattening the curve there, there's a, an alarming increase in some of the cases recently and i'm hoping it's not going to get out of control uh, but, but certainly from a uh, economic perspective um, there's two things that have lessened the, the burden. And the first is a huge amount of government stimulus that has been poured into the system. The other is that the Canadian banks, which are so prominent here and so much support for, for um, so many mid-sized businesses, they've been incredibly patient and, uh, you know, they're, they're giving their uh, borrowers lots of time and they're certainly not enforcing unless they absolutely have to. So um, that's, you know, that's certainly slowed down the tide of insolvencies. Uh, as far as government support, uh, it probably looks very similar to what you'll see in your part of the world. Uh, we have the wage subsidy program, which is a 75% wage subsidy, uh, which has kept a lot of people employed through the last six months. There were a number of uh, uh, business loans and credit programs to inject uh, liquidity into the system which got a lot of money out very quickly. And there, there are also some programs set up uh, for commercial tenants, which have been less successful. But having said that, uh, you know, it really has uh, kept things going, but notwithstanding all of that, uh, a huge contraction in activity and a lot of job losses over the last few months. Um, just to give a sense, we were heading into a recession in Q1. Uh, in the second quarter, GDP went down about 40%. And it's bounced back in the third quarter, but, but very much artificially uh, driven by the uh, stimulus. Um, a real concern is, uh, you know, what's going to happen with all of these job losses and are they going to be recouped, uh, particularly in some of the heavily hit industries like uh, travel and leisure and, and some certain retail. Uh, and then, of course, the other concern on everybody's minds is, you know, what happens when we start weaning people off some of these government programs. Uh, virtually every insolvency practitioner and banker and other professional I speak to, you know, predicts that we, you know, this, this trend is just getting started and, and there should be very uh, many filings, uh, you know, end of the year into next year. So that's what we're bracing ourselves for. Um, as far as industries hit, I mean, obviously the airlines have been grounded, but we haven't had any, uh, filings yet, like Virgin. Uh, there's a certain retail have been hit, as Ian said, it's a bit of a mixed bag, like essential retail, like groceries are doing incredibly well. 
people who made the transition online are also doing well. And then there's the traditional bricks and mortar retailers who are unable to do things with their landlords. And, uh, you know, we've already seen this, this wave of, of filings and cross-border filings starting. So I think that's going to continue. Oil and gas has been hard hit, and as has the travel and leisure industry. Uh, Canada's, you, you may, many of you may know Cirque du Soleil that puts on shows around the world. It's a Quebec export, and they filed several months ago as a result of uh, attendance going from 100% down to zero. <laughs> um, so yeah, lots, you know, lots of activities starting to happen. Uh, and, and I think as insolvency practitioners around the world, you know, we hold a lot of the essential tools that will be able to help companies restructure and hopefully help start rebuild things as we come out of this. You know, in Canada, we are very fortunate. We have some tremendous restructuring tools under the CCAA and the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. Um, so uh, that's, that's great. We also have a very sophisticated uh, commercial court that specializes in insolvencies. They very quickly pivoted to online during the crisis so that there's been uninterrupted access and that's been amazing. Um, and and it's, I mean, it's different from Australia. You know, we don't have these draconian laws for uh, trading while insolvent. Uh, and uh, yeah, certainly it's, it's a much easier climate to restructure, very much more like uh, chapter 11. I know you guys have, uh, have some temporary measures uh, for safe, safe harbor for directors and there are other things that are being talked about, uh, reform, which I think would be welcome at this point in time. So really for us, uh, you know, we're, we're heads down. Uh, we are keeping in very close contact with uh, people like yourselves at Rogers Reedy and all of our other BTG partners. Because in my view, this is a global crisis. I think it's going to require global solutions. And, you know, I'm just delighted that we've got strong partners all over the world that we can rely on and, uh, and, and help our clients through these difficult times. So let me, let me stop there and hand it back uh, to hear from your part of the world. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. I think I've upset a couple of your clients because they said, um, can you not mention Justin Bieber? Can you mention Drake? Drake came from Canada. Drake, not just Drake's Bieber. much better, yes. <laughs> much better. I apologise. Thank you for that, Alan. Um, now we're moving closer to Australia, um, um, away from Canada. We're moving to Malaysia. And um, Alex Chang, who is one of the partners in our Rogers Reedy um, KL office. Um, good morning to good you. Good morning. Alex, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Please tell us all about what's happening in Malaysia and in, in, um, in businesses that are impacted by COVID. Sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, wherever you are. So uh, maybe let me just start by uh, explaining the current COVID-19 situation in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia started the lockdown sometime in March 2020. And uh, based on statistics, it is estimated that the Malaysia economy suffers uh, daily losses of uh, RM 2.4 billion every day, which is close to a US dollar, half a billion. And uh, subsequently in May 2020, the government actually uh, relaxed the lockdown. And now we are in the recovery phase, which started sometime in June till end of this year. Uh, let me quickly share with you what are the protection and support that has been afforded by the government. Uh, very similar to everywhere around the world, basically there is a income support and wish subsidy program. Uh, we do have a uh, relief facility funds, credit scheme grants, uh, which is actually trying to encourage uh, liquidity in the market. And there's also a cutting of uh, overnight policy rate for four times this year to encourage spending and lower the cost of borrowing in Malaysia with a view to spur the economy. On top of that, uh, the government of Malaysia actually introduced a temporary winding up protection from April this year at to end of uh, December 2020, whereby there will not uh, that the threshold for winding up proceeding has been increased, and the timeline for uh, credit uh, debtors to respond to notice of demand has been increased as well. The government also introduced a six-month automatic moratorium on loan repayment for SMEs and individuals in Malaysia, which is ending in September 2020. And uh, recently, Malaysia have just passed a COVID-19 bill in the lower house of the parliament. 
which covers uh, areas such as non-performance of contractual obligation, uh, housing development law in terms of construction, late payment interest, late delivery and LADs, and uh, increase the threshold for bankruptcy, and also setting up a COVID-19 mediation center. However, in terms of efficiency in, of passing the bill, uh, perhaps it's a little bit too late or too little or too late compared to Singapore and Australia, whereby they have passed their COVID-19 bill in a very short period of time. Next, uh, I'll highlight to you some of the losers and winners of uh, COVID-19 and a part of the lockdown. Obviously, uh, similarly across the world, basically hospitality and tourism related industry suffers the most due to the lockdown and travel ban. There's closures of multiples of hotels around Malaysia. Aviation industry in Malaysia got hit pretty badly as well. And uh, during the period of lockdown, brick and mortar retailers and food and uh, beverages, FMBs, uh, entertainments, gaming centers, cinemas, nightlife, event related companies that uh, host uh, exhibition, concerts, sports and cultural events. And uh, one of the other industries that actually suffers is that Malaysia actually, there are industries that rely heavily on cheap, low skill migrant workers, such as manufacturing, construction, plantations. As a result of the travel ban and uh, basically the industry just doesn't have the supply of workers anymore. In terms of winners, uh, Malaysia being one of the major or world largest producer of uh, rubber, rubber glove makers in the world with a market share of 65% have actually seen the emergence of two new billionaires in Malaysia due to the surge of the global glove demand. There is also uh, manufacturers of uh, medical related products. They are the obvious winners as well. Face mask producers, PPE, alcohol wipes and sanitizers. And um, due to the lockdown, actually, uh, we have seen a spur in terms of uh, e-commerce platforms. Everyone is staying at home and uh, they, buy, they buy from home. And um, we just transitioned to contactless payment due to COVID-19. So it's actually, that, 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 that is things, there's good things that emerges from COVID-19, in fact. So uh, lastly, I'll just go through quickly what are the current trends and uh, how the insolvency scenario in Malaysia moving forward. The first question that is on every insolvency practitioner's mind is that what happens after the automatic moratoriums end on September 30th and also the end of temporary winding up protection on 31st December 2020. We believe that uh, there will be a surge in terms of uh, insolvency. I mean insolvency industry will actually see a surge in terms of uh, engagements and workloads and um, as of now, because of the temporary winding up protection and also the automatic moratorium, there has been an increase in take up of a scheme of arrangement and corporate rescue mechanism, which is introduced uh, recently in Malaysia two years ago, such as a judicial manage manager corporate voluntary arrangement. So as of now, the banks, the financial institutions and the companies, they are more towards a turnaround and restructuring, not so much of liquidation or receivership. And uh, the next good thing that will happen in Malaysia, hopefully, is that there has been a proposed Companies Amendment Bill 2020. We are hoping that we can keep up with uh, America, Singapore, in terms of uh, strengthening the restructuring framework through scheme of arrangement and corporate rescue mechanism. So this ends uh, my brief uh, sharing of uh, what is happening in Malaysia. I will pass it back to Bren. Thank you, Bren. Thank you, Alex. I uh, very much appreciate that. Um, we will now move to Hong Kong. Um, Alan uh, Chung is uh, the partner in charge of our Rogers Reedy office in Hong Kong, and he's been kind enough to, uh, today to um, be present to have a, have a chat to us about how COVID is affecting businesses in Hong Kong. And there's been a lot of changes in Hong Kong over the last six to 12 months. Good morning, Alan. How are you? Hi, Grant. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Alan from the Hong Kong Rogers VT office, and I'm um, able to um, speak about um, the current situation in Hong Kong. Um, um, the COVID starts in Hong Kong just after the Chinese New Year in February 2020, and it has spread all over the city. And um, as you all will know, um, before the COVID-19, uh, we have the social political events um, start in June 2019. This already affects um, the economy in Hong Kong. 
um, especially the retail, uh, F&B, and um, the uh, tourism business. After the COVID starts, um, uh, it reaches the high in March and April, and all parts of the city have been locked down with work from home, um, and the high court has been closed, and, and the only limited dining um, for restaurants and no tourists. Um, it drops about 95% of the tourists. It accounts for 32% of the surface um, uh, revenue, surface industry revenue in Hong Kong. That um, mostly affected a business will be um, the um, travel agents and um, uh, especially uh, the airline business. Uh, for, some, for example, Cafe Pacific. Uh, and um, they are all uh, have no pay leaves and uh, it will happen in uh, next month. They, they will be uh, large layouts for, for Cafe Pacific. Hmm. Uh, um, speak about the, the government uh, subsidies for uh, Hong Kong people and uh, uh, they will have uh, 10,000 Hong Kong dollars for all residents in Hong Kong and uh, some industry uh, relief for um, uh, FMB and um, travel business and um, retail stores and uh, wage subsidy for all industries for 9,000 uh, Hong Kong dollars per people per month for six months. And the government financial secretary predicted that um, the economic impact of the coronavirus outbreak would prove to be more severe than it was in 2003 when the city was hit by uh, SARS. And um, uh, let's talk about um, the, the uh, industry uh, benefit from, from the COVID-19. And uh, I heard about that um, uh, the delivery, delivery service of, of the food uh, for uh, delivery rule and a food panda rises about 60% of the turnover since uh, the, the start of COVID. And, um, it was help um, help them a lot because uh, lots of people and are in uh, employed, and they all changed to be the delivery man. And uh, let's talk about um, uh, the bankruptcies and uh, uh, liquidations in Hong Kong. Uh, after the COVID nineteen, uh, because the the shutdown of the uh, high court, uh, it had been uh, no um, petition. Uh, one day petition and bankruptcy petition for people. After the reopens of the court in, um, in May, uh, the filing of pe um, personal uh, bankruptcy petition and one day petition rise about 20 to 25% um, as of last year. And uh, our, our business in Hong Kong for uh, the insolvency is, has been raised uh, for individual uh, voluntary arrangement, the debt restructuring for individuals, and the personal uh, bankruptcy uh, uh, issues. And we have been appointed a liquidator of, of a chain uh, coffee shop uh, from uh, Korea in Hong Kong. Um, it has about five, uh, five locations in Hong Kong. And we have been appointed the liquidator of the uh, government, uh, uh, garment, garment industry, garment group of companies that ma uh, manufactures uh, uh, garments because of the filing of the bankruptcy of the largest customer in Sweden, so they they cannot survive and and uh, all go into liquidation. Yeah, um, that's uh, that's end my uh, uh, brief uh, introduction of the Hong Kong economic and uh, situation in Hong Kong. Thanks, Thanks Alan. Thank you very much, Alan. That was very informative, and um, really appreciate your time today. Now we move move away from Southeast Asia to um, a, a little place just uh, off the east of coast of Australia, um, New Zealand, and um, one of our dear friends. Uh, Derek Assam, who is uh, going to speak to us today, talking about how COVID has impacted businesses in New Zealand and, and what the um, what mechanisms have been implemented by the New Zealand government. Um, they have been the gold standard um, in respect to dealing with COVID from um, from the medical side of things. Um, good morning. Oh, good afternoon, Derek. How are you? Uh, good afternoon, Chris. Well, warm welcome to, uh, from New Zealand, the holders of the America's Cup, the home of the All Blacks, and the land of 20 million sheep. Only 5 million people. 
Um, and just for clarification, we are not a state of Australia. <laughs> yes, um, I'm, I'm Derek R. Sam from Rogers Ready, New Zealand. Um, just for our background, uh, COVID hit our shores in late February, and by the end of the March, we were in a hard lockdown uh, until the 28th of April. The New Zealand government, their strategy is one of elimination of COVID, so it was go hard and go early. And this meant some of the strictest um, measures in the world, similar to what Victoria is experiencing now. Um, we still have current restrictions. We still got a few cases. I mean, today we only had one case and that was caught at the border. Uh, we've probably got under 100 active cases at, the, at this stage. Um, Auckland is at a slightly higher level of restrictions because that's where the, out, the, the cluster came from. Um, so we're a bit like Victoria and South. Uh, we, we can't attend some events. So in Brent, uh, Aucklanders were excluded from a marathon in Rotorua and only refunding half of the uh, entry fee, which is, uh, I don't know why that works. Um, yeah, so, so the, the restrictions are, we still got a closed border. Auckland can only have groups of up to 10, while the rest of the country can have group sizes of up to 100. Um, but in a way of stimulus relief packages, the government offered uh, what called safe harbour provisions for directors, you know, for the reckless trading. Interesting enough, that, that comes to an end, end of this, this month, September, but we believe that will be extended. Uh, uh, there's a scheme called debt hibernation. Uh, it's, it's similar to a creditors compromise where a proposal is put forward to freeze the company's debts for six months, creditors vote on the proposal whether it goes ahead or not, and in that period no enforcement can be taken. But the issue with, with all, all these uh, initiatives that the companies that we're seeing now, um, like what we call them like the first wave, were already in trouble before COVID hit. So they, they were technically insolvent at the end of December, so these, these, are, these relief packages weren't available to them. Um, just also disappointing to see that the government talked about relief for tenants of commercial leases. Nothing happened. Um, and so it was really up to tenants and landlords to negotiate themselves. So there was nothing binding there. Um, some, some landlords actually refused to, to negotiate at all. Um, financial support, similar to the rest of Australia, we've had what ours is called the wage subsidy. We've had three tranches of it. Uh, the first was an eight weeks, oh, sorry, 12 weeks. Then we had an extension to eight weeks, further eight weeks, and then what we call a resurgence, because we had a little cluster outbreak, another two weeks. But you, of course, you had to show some drop in revenue from 30 to 40%. Uh, small business loans, which the government was just handing out money to small businesses, unsecured. A business finance guarantee scheme where the banks if the banks lent money to small businesses, uh, the government would guarantee 80% of it. Banks were actually reluctant to jump on board with that. Um, they were pretty risk adverse, so that actually didn't uh, gather any momentum. Um, and also, we, we are seeing banks tightening up. There's not a lot of credit out there for businesses. Um, and if, if you do put a proposal forward, it's uh, scrutinised through the credit team. Uh, the outlook. I, I believe we're in the eye of the storm as all these relief packages are now coming to an end for, for New Zealand. Um, these small businesses or businesses will have to make a decision which way they go. Uh, we are now seeing the tax office starting to issue statutory demands for enforcement. Um, that's only started in the last couple of weeks. So what we call these zombie companies that were, should have been closed or before COVID, they're, they're being attacked now by the uh, tax office. Um, we're expecting unemployment rate to increase from four to eight percent over over next year. Uh, landlords are now losing patience and starting to issue notices for eviction, and also creditors are now starting to take enforcement actions. Uh, one of the interesting things too, we're seeing a more uh, getting a number of calls on shareholder disputes, where uh, where one shareholder is saying, "Hey, look, we can't continue. I need to, we need to pull the plug," and the other saying, "Yes, we want to continue." But usually the one that wants to continue hasn't got the funds to inject into the business. 
so it's making it quite difficult for them. Uh, the industries that are affected, similar to what I've heard from the rest of the, the, the speakers, tourism. And tourism makes up 20% of our export revenue, employs 10% of our workforce. But the government has provided relief to sp specific operators that they consider strategic in, in the recovery of the tourism sector. So they are pumping at it. So when, it, when we do open our borders and Australians want to come to Queenstown, these operators or restaurants will be will be there. Um, and linked to the tourism is hospitality. Uh, we are seeing a number of closures now. And in the, in the headlines yesterday, one landlord issued five eviction, eviction notices uh, of, of the 11 restaurants in their complex. So five out of 11. So he's, I think he's just had enough of that industry and wants to Re reuse the, of, of that space because it's he can, he can see the writings on the wall for a, for, for probably a couple of years until it rebounds. Um, again, commercial property, a lot of space in the CBD. Uh, PDWC opened their new tower oh, a couple of months ago. Most of them are still working from home. I think uh, for them to get up to their floors, it could take six hours to, to get to their floors of the, with the social distancing. Um, and, we, and we've got that online retail uh, presence versus sh shop presence. And, and you know, a lot, a lot of now retail have just gone, gone online. Horticulture business, uh, we need 10,000 seasonal workers by the end of the month. Borders are closed, where do they come from? And, and really just to wrap it up, Brent, um, you now there are some good stories, liquor stores, DIY, home improvements, supermarkets, Toilet roll manufacturers, but I still don't see the link between COVID and and toilet paper. So I'll look. I'll, I'll pass it over to you. And maybe you can enlighten the audience. <laughs> no, we have the same same issue in Australia as well. Is the first thing that got um, sold out and um, in all the supermarkets in Australia were were toilet rolls, toilet paper. Um, thank you, Derek. Really appreciate um, your insight into New Zealand. Um, we move across uh, the waters. Um, to Australia. So we, we've now got a, a, a short segment on Australia. Um, we, we've got Shane Kremen from our Melbourne office who's going to give an introduction about how uh, COVID is affecting businesses in Australia and then he'll talk about Victoria. Um, good afternoon, Shane. Um, welcome today. Uh, thanks, Brent, and good afternoon all from lockdown here in Victoria. As Brent mentioned, I'll, I'll give a broad overview of what's happening in Australia and then focus on Victoria. Uh, we had our first case coronavirus here in Australia back in January and then with cases spiking significantly uh, down in March. And as of today, we've had just shy of 27,000 cases across Australia um, with Victoria unfortunately reporting almost 75% of the total cases we've had. Uh, we've had state border closures and, and widespread industry closures since March, and Australia's officially in its first recession in 29 years, with GDP dropping by 7% in the June quarter. What we'll see in the future will depend on whether we can continue to contain the um, case numbers and how long we're gonna remain in lockdown here in Victoria. Hopefully we're, we're looking on the up there. Uh, industry is hardest hit, very similar to a lot of the other uh, countries we've heard from this afternoon, tourism, hospitality, suffering revenue decrease of just shy of 40%. Arts and recreation down uh, around 23%, same with transport and warehousing. Interestingly, and for the same reasons, retail's only suffered a slight drop. Most people in Victoria anyway, uh, sitting at home, buying up big, um, putting up their houses so they can uh, get through their daily work routine. Um, estimated over 1 million people so far in Australia have lost their jobs. Um, despite some of the government relief packages we've had, a uh, majority of those being across the hospitality, tourism and arts sectors. Unemployment rate, we're currently at 7.5% uh, unemployment. The government estimates that's going to peak at the end of the year at around 9.25%. So that's over $1.2 million, $1 million jobs lost. Sorry. So to focus on Victoria, we've been under restrictions here since the 20th of March. As I mentioned earlier, state borders have been closed. 
Uh, to us, all non-essential services, such as hospitality and gatherings, uh, were ordered to stop, and there's a work from home direction um, for the state government. We thought we got the case numbers under control, um, and hospitality briefly reopened in June, with some strict distancing and patronage uh, rules in place. However, we had um, what you may have heard of, the hotel quarantine security bungle here. If you haven't heard of that, look it up. It's an interesting read. Um, cases spiked again because of that. We're up at over 700 cases at, at some point, and we're now back in hard lockdown. So our lockdown, from what I can tell, is, seems to be one of the harshest in the world currently. Uh, all workplaces are closed unless you're deemed to be a permitted worker. Um, we've been, our Rogers Ready office in Melbourne, we've been working from home since March. Schools are closed, so on top of, uh, you know, a lot of parents working from home, we're also homeschooling our kids, which has been uh, very interesting to say the least. I've learned a lot about my kids and me. <laughs> um, it, restrictions eased slightly on the weekends. We're now allowed to go outside for two hours a day for exercise uh, within a five kilometre radius of our houses. And we, we can, of course, leave home to go grocery shopping for medical reasons. Um, we're under a strict curfew between 9pm and 5am. We can't leave our homes. Um, so there's some plans for some slight easing of those restrictions uh, over the next month or so. If our case numbers stay uh, relatively low, the next stage of easing, from what I can tell, it looks like dog groomers will open so we can take our pets to be groomed, but we still won't be able to get a haircut which I'm in uh, dire need of, obviously. Uh, this, as, as of this morning, the case numbers are at 42. So well down from where they were, we need them to stay you know, b below 30 so we can get back out by Christmas, uh, hopefully. In terms of the government relief packages, um, as mentioned earlier, we have the JobKeeper package, which is $86 billion um, wage subsidy to keep people employed. And that's phasing down, that's due to phase out by March next year. Um, so basically we have the government funding a large portion of the wages uh, across Australia. We've got, had a moratorium on insolvent training, as was mentioned earlier, and also an increase in the periods to comply with the statutory demand and a bankruptcy notice in 21 days up to six months with some increases in the dollar thresholds too for those notices. Um, on top of that, several specific industry relief packages as well. So government's throwing a lot of money at it um, to keep businesses propped up in the meantime. Shane, just to um, inter interrupt there, I'm very interested to know um, about the insolvent trading relief and the moratorium on um, stat demands that basically, you know, it's going to take six months before a stat demand can be uh, issued and expire. Um, it, it, has it had any impact on insolvencies in, in Australia? Yeah, thanks Brent, it's had a major impact. We heard the term before with uh, the zombie companies unintentional side effect of, of the government relief packages is that there's no pressure, very limited pressure on companies now to pay their debts. And so we have companies surviving on the JobKeeper, um, creditors who are supplying legitimate services or goods can't enforce their debts because it takes six months now for a statutory demand to expire. Um, they're being propped up by the government relief, continue to trade. A lot of them won't be able to pay the debts they're incurring. Um, and despite you know, regardless of a coronavirus pandemic, these companies would have been wound up anyway. We have an average of 600 companies a month. Um, so in terms of corporate insolvencies, they've dropped by 60% compared to the same time last year. In the last two months, uh, corporate wind-ups are down 90%. We haven't seen, for example, the tax office uh, issue any, any wind-up applications in the last two months. So it's been a significant drop in terms of insolvency. So, on, on that note, I'll uh, hand it back over, Brent. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, we'll move north um, to uh, Andrew Barden, who is uh, is a director in our Sydney office. He, Andrew's going to speak on New South Wales and Queensland. Um, us Victorians are not happy at the moment with uh, New South Wales and Queensland because we're not allowed to go there for our holidays. It's much warmer for you know for our friends overseas. It's much warmer in Queensland and New South Wales um, than what it is in Victoria. So we want to get up there for our holidays, but uh, they won't let us up there. Um, good afternoon, Andrew. How are you? G'day, Brent. Um, from sunny Sydney. Uh, very well, thank you. Beautiful day here in Sydney. It might be 30 degrees tomorrow in Sydney. So it's all looking good. 
Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, the effects of COVID-19 on the Premier State New South Wales and the Sunshine State Queensland. Um, Queensland and to a lesser extent New South Wales haven't been as badly affected by the second wave of COVID-19, unlike our friends so south of the border. But notwithstanding this, there are hard border closures in place between New South Wales and Victoria and also New South Wales and Queensland. And this is causing a lot of political tension between the state and federal governments and also across party lines, not to mention that uh, it's costing the various states tens of million dollars a day to have these border closures. Current daily cases are between five to 10 cases in each state, including hotel quarantine for returning Aussies that are coming back in from overseas. Uh, as mentioned by our North American counterparts, uh, commercial building occupancies and are down significantly. Sydney commercial buildings are at 40% occupancy. Queensland is a little better, but basically Sydney is dead, the CBD. Um, though, however, that's expected to increase as the warmer weather comes back and uh, as we get a bit closer to Christmas. Interesting, we found that um, many viable businesses are struggling to obtain insurance renewals at the moment. Um, this is due to the insurance market globally contracting and that's causing some issues on otherwise viable businesses trying to, are struggling to survive in this uncertain times. Uh, as everyone said, there's been winners and losers in this two-pace economy. Some are booming, others are in uh, crisis management. Uh, the, the winners that we're seeing at the moment, infrastructure spending by the governments is, is at an all-time high. So think of earth moving, roadworks, etc. Also local uh, suburban cafes and shops are booming due to working from home and the shop local campaign that's been pushing through. Also as part of the, um, the lockdowns that were early in the year, um, you're allowed out for exercise for a couple of hours. So outdoor uh, entertaining, outdoor, uh, home fitness, such as bike shops, sports stores, and activewear uh, have been booming those types of business. And in recent time, camping stores as people get out and about and trying to uh, see this, these great states. Um, that regard, state-based domestic tourism is going really well. The regional areas uh, that have the wines and the, the coastal reason, regions um, interesting, there's been reports that uh, people are looking at purchasing holiday homes on the south coast of New South Wales and the sunshine coast of Queensland. Uh, the money they would be spending to go overseas, they're now looking at put, uh, investing that in some uh, real estate to uh, add to their, um, for their holiday exposures uh, moving forward. Another winner, of course, is the deep clean, cleaning businesses. Uh, a lot of businesses, uh, they have a COVID uh, contact, they need to be cleaned. It is a quite int labour intensive and specialised business and they're booming. Also um, uh, booming, expected to boom this year is the agricultural sector, not because of uh, COVID, but due to the large uh, improvement in the season. We're coming off a seven year drought. It's been a great season uh, for most places except for Queensland. Large parts of Queensland are still in drought, but New South Wales and the Southern states and Western Australia are booming. Cotton is meant to be at an all-time high this year, but comes with that uh, issues with contract labour uh, due to COVID and the border closures and getting equipment across the borders. So watch this space of uh, what's going to happen with that contracting labour and the shearing, fruit picking and other industries. On the other side, the losers. Uh, education has been a big hit that sector especially the universities and international training colleges that rely heavily on international students have been significantly affected by the international border closures. Flowing on from that, the international tourism businesses, think travel agents, hotel, hostels, but also transport, the bus companies, the hire car, car companies and taxis. taxis. You've seen Hertz car, Hertz car rentals in the States file for protection. And uh, there's talk that a lot of the high car rental car fleets in Australia are also struggling. Uh, the traditional bricks and mortar retailers in the large and CBD centres are uh, being affected together with their city based hospitality, gyms and cinemas. Um, this is not just uh, New South Wales and Queensland, but 
will be across all of Australia, but uh, they are affected in uh, significantly with no one in the CBD areas. And also city-based office uh, space and associated services. So think cleaning, uh, facilities management, that's also have a, having a flow on effect. Uh, as I mentioned, commercial buildings at 40% occupancy, it's expected that trend will be down and continue to be down, but to what effect? Uh, hot desking is not a, a very hygienic and uh, appropriate uh, form of uh, office uh, space management in the current climate. So that, we see that coming back a little bit as people come back into the office space. Also, the events and art space industry. Think sports, music, cultural events. Most major events across New South Wales and Queensland have been cancelled for the late 2020 and the start of 2021. Look at the City to Surf uh, Fun Run. It's due to be held uh, now. That's been cancelled. The Country Music Festival in Tamworth. Um, and uh, unfortunately for the Melbourneites, the AFL Grand Final has been pushed up to Queensland, up to Brisbane. Um, for them to uh, have it under behind closed doors in a reduced capacity. First time that's happened in the lifetime of the Aussie rules. So not good for the Melbourne uh, and Victorian people, but back over to you, Brent. 120 years uh, that um, the AFL, VFL has been operating and for those, that amount of time, it's been in Victoria, but not this year. It's going to be Queensland, but we'll move on. We're not bitter. Let, let's move to um, our dear friend, um, the partner in charge of our um, Darwin office, um, and that's Stuart Reid. Now, Stuart's going to speak about um, South Australia and Northern Territory. Um, I, I do note that, uh, that Stuart's wearing a tie. Now, it's the first time I've ever seen Stuart wear a tie. It's, it's for our international guests, it's, a, it's about 35 degrees Celsius, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit today and 90 plus percent um, humidity so it's warm up there and uh, people don't wear ties but on to better things Stuart please please tell us about um, how COVID is affecting South Australia and uh, the Northern Territory for their businesses. Thanks Brent and uh, welcome from the far north. The Northern Territory is a, a large landmass but very small population with less than a quarter of a million people only one percent of the Australian uh, population. Uh, we've managed the health side very well. We've only had 34 cases in total. We've uh, no deaths and there's been uh, uh, no active cases for uh, many, many uh, weeks. Uh, we had restrictions early in the piece, but they were quickly eased and uh, presently the only restriction is social distancing. Uh, we opened our borders two months ago. Uh, we've had more than 70,000 interstate arrivals since and Thankfully, no uh, community, yeah, community transmission, so hopefully that can be replicated in other states. Um, our borders are open, remain open, but only Victorians have got a quarantine. Uh, we had uh, a somewhat unique um, border control, it's called Borders Within Borders. Uh, given the indigenous population here in the NT and the vulnerability of those, um, the government uh, enacted some biosecurity legislation which effectively gave them the power to restrict asset, um, access to large tracts of indigenous land um, and that's, uh, that worked well and certainly was necessary. Uh, two sort of major su uh, su supports given by government. First is the monetary support. There's been about 250 million of new money pumped into the economy. The other uh, bit of government support is that uh, with all the various levels of local government, state, uh, yeah, commonwealth defence, uh, almost one in four of the charity workforce is employed by government and therefore that cushions the impact of COVID on the energy economy. Uh, winners and losers, the winners can be really in two groups. The winners that uh, win because of the government support on offer and um, uh, the winners from the actual pandemic itself. As far as the uh, winners from the government support, uh, hospitality and tourism, uh, given the very short shutdown that we had um, and the tourism vouchers that have been pumped out by government, is, uh, they've rebounded well, particularly when um, coupled with JobKeeper. Uh, the, uh, the, the second major winner 
is homeowners in the SME construction businesses because of the, the government's generous uh, home improvement scheme. Uh, there was a, a, a massive take up um, uh, of that scheme and uh, that will take 12 months to uh, boom through the economy. But uh, that's certainly taken a business, uh, that's taken a, an economy that was really struggling um, to actually keep in uh, uh, a lot of the construction businesses moving. Uh, winners as far as the actual pandemic itself. Uh, firstly, we're hoping as uh, the Northern Territory, we, our population is one of the only populations in uh, Australia that's declining. Uh, we like to think that people would now see the Northern Territory as a safe place to live and work. And uh, hopefully we can uh, redress that and actually see some net movement into the Territory. The second big winner, uh, we had a, a, an election a territory election last month and uh, the Labour government uh, campaigned almost solely on the issue of border controls and uh, they were returned. So that might be a, a bit of an indicator for Queensland and WA with their elections which are coming up. As far as the losers, uh, similar to the other states, uh, businesses, tourism businesses relying on um, international travellers uh, and remote uh, low, uh, remote territory tourism operators are suffering. Uh, as far as South Australia is concerned, similar to the territory, they've had low numbers of COVID and no active cases for weeks. Um, their borders are open to uh, everyone except for New South Wales um, and Victoria. Uh, they've pumped in, their uh, the government's pumped in about two billion in support. Property prices continue to rise. There hasn't been a lull because of any uncertainty with COVID. Uh, interestingly, the apprenticeships are up 10% uh, off the back of uh, uh, government stimulus um, and uh, business growth across childcare, medical practices, gyms, etc. The key loser for South Australia is the, uh, there was a heavy reliance on the uh, international student market and given the lockdown on uh, international arrivals, that's obviously had an impact there. Uh, back to you, thanks Brent. Thanks Stuart. Um, we'll go to our second last speaker, um, which is Shelley Brooks. Shelley Brooks is the partner in charge of our, of our Tasmanian offices. Um, Shelley, good afternoon. Hi, thanks Brent. Welcome to everyone for attending today. Um, just to give you a quick snapshot of Tasmania. Um, we are an island. We are part of Australia um, for our international guests today. Yes, we do have the Tasmanian devil. No, it doesn't spin around like it does on the cartoon. Um, we have a population of about 540,000. So we're, we think we're big, but we're quite small in comparison. So our COVID stats, we had 230 cases. We've had 217 recovered and 13 deaths. Our biggest outbreak was due to the Ruby Princess cruise ship, and that was up the northwest of the state. Um, so we're pretty much like South Australia and Northern Territory and WA. We've got some restrictions, social distancing, but pretty relaxed down here doing what we want to do. Our borders are closed and remain closed to the rest of the world <laughs> until the 1st of December 2020. Um, we have a big moat that keeps everyone away so they can't even cling to us. Um, Tasmania has well, small business, so 95% of our businesses are classed as small business and we have the highest median age in the whole country. Uh, it's estimated due to COVID that our state debt for 2021 could actually blow out to be as high as $2 billion. So industries that have been hit the hardest down here, along with everyone else in Australia, we're seeing issues in retail and hospitality. However, tourism represents about 10% of our state's economy and employs about 17% of our people. So this is much bigger than any other state within Australia. And in the year up until September 2019, we saw over 1.2 million visitors to the state. And this included over 293,000 overseas tourists. Uh, these tourists have actually, or did inject, approximately $2.93 billion into our economy while they were here. This is all now at a complete standstill. Um, it's estimated that in 2021, we'll probably only see about 90,000 overseas tourists. So there's a considerable drop there. 
We're also pretty big in export for our agriculture and aquaculture. So these guys were hit pretty hard. However, for us, there was actually a big bonus. Crayfish couldn't get out of the state. We were quite happy paying $50 per kilo and eating them up. Prices have now increased again. There's no more crayfish on our menu. Um, just a bit of perspective. So after the GFC, it took Tasmania about nine years to recover to its previous levels of employment, yet it took the rest of Australia only about nine months. So yeah, we've got a bit of catching up to do once this is all over. Um, it's anticipated that there could be up to 27,000 job losses um, across our state, and this could increase our unemployment up to about 12%. So in the first three weeks, we had 19,000 job losses. Our peak was 20,000. Due to JobKeeper, um, these, these amounts have now dropped, um, but it is estimated to rise again once JobKeeper ends. Um, the Employment Vulnerability Index actually mapped data for our state with the most high risk areas in Tasmania at 34.92%. We've also seen some significant drops in our housing market. So we've recorded the sharpest drop in rents in the country with units being down by about 4.5%. Across the rest of Australia, that's at only about 2.6%. And in housing, we've actually had a drop of 2% and the rest of Australia have only seen a drop by about 0.3%. The main reason for this is really looking at the transition of short stay accommodation. We have a lot of Airbnb. Um, due to the lack of tourism, these, uh, uh, these parts of accommodation have now been put into long term. Um, and with the border closures and job losses, this has contributed to this drop. So we currently have approximately 8,000 households currently living in housing distress across Tasmania and approximately 120,000 Tasmanians living below the poverty line. Now, the Tasmanian government has um, injected over $1 billion in support initiatives throughout our state. And this is significantly above average state spend per G GDP, if I can get the words out. Um, the government's really focusing on the vulnerable industries such as tourism, construction and hospitality. And the most recent initiative that we have had is uh, trying to get us all out there in our own state, looking at tourism and providing a holiday at home. However, their vouchers at about $7 million sold out, well, sold out, we got them for free, were all gone within about 20 minutes. So a lot of us missed out on those. Um, back to you, Brent. Thank you, Shelley. And, and now to our last speaker. Thank you for staying with us. Um, Jack James is uh, our partner in our Perth office. Um, and um, it's good morning to Jack. How are you, Jack? Good morning, Brent. And hello to everyone. We're doing well here in Western Australia. Western Australia, for those overseas uh, guests, is the largest state in Australia by land size. Um, <clears throat> We do have a hard state border in place here that the government, the state government put in place. Unlike the Tasmanian um, situation though, we have no idea when the Premier will lift the border and let people in and let us out, I guess. Um, <clears throat> having said that, uh, the current restrictions in place are fairly low. Uh, we have sporting events uh, with capacity restraints and that sort of thing, but Day-to-day day -day life here is, is relatively normal and business is relatively normal. The WA economy is very much dependent on the mining industry. Uh, in fact, and interestingly, in March this year, the value of exports out of WA reached an all-time record of almost $18 billion, so during the first wave of the COVID virus. Those, those, those numbers declined in April and May, but in June, they've grown again uh, and in June, we're almost $16 billion. There were some significant job losses in the state initially, uh, of around 100,000. But again, with the restrictions coming off, employment grew 40,000 in, in uh, June and July. As I said, uh, WA's main business uh, is, is mining. It contributes to almost 40% of, gro of gross straight product. Uh, it's remained strong during the COVID uh, pandemic on the back of very strong iron ore prices and historically high gold prices, um, which has really driven 
corporate activity here in WA, uh, both in the very big end of town, but also in the small uh, cap uh, market within Perth uh, corporate sector. Uh, the hate hard, sta hard state border has uh, caused some uh, issues for the mining industry. Uh, the big miners, BHP and Rio, FMG and uh, Roy Hill, rely heavily on FIFO workers, people flying into the state from outside, um, not just Australia, but also uh, we have a significant FIFO workforce flying in from Singapore. With the hard state borders, obviously that has curtailed that significantly, uh, unless they, they can they meet the requirements and quarantine. In response, BHP has announced that it will relocate its uh, FIFO workforce to within WA. Uh, and we will, will require all new operational um, staff to be either based in Western Australia or be prepared to move to the state of Western Australia. Uh, moving on from mining, tourism with the hard state border, obviously overseas numbers have declined significantly. The effect around Perth isn't as great as up north where the international tourism was really important for the tourism operators and transport operators in the north of the state around the Kimberley and the Pilbara. Around Perth locally, uh, tourism has been strong, driven by local tourism uh, for people in Perth who can't go anywhere else, heading down south or, or within a day's or two's drive out of Perth. Retail, uh, with the restrictions being eased, um, grew again in May and June, uh, and with household support, there's more people spending money. In agriculture, as, as um, Andrew mentioned earlier, agriculture in Australia, in certain parts of Australia, is really strong on the back of uh, strong prices, uh, anticipated strong yields this year, and especially in the southeast of Western Australia, uh, land values over the last couple of years have really trended upwards and remain strong. However, there will be challenges for those areas in the agricultural sector that reply, rely on um, the backpacker workforce that traditionally come into Australia in the back end of the year. Um, if we, they're anticipating there'll be a 50% shortfall in labour uh, to those sectors, which is pro proving to be going to be a significant um, constraint or possible risk for those agricultural sectors. From uh, an incentive point of view or initiatives point of view, the West Australian Government has introduced a, a $400 million housing package that will support over 4,000 jobs. Uh, that's including uh, house, social housing programs and grants for new home builders. Like um, was spoken by um, others, it's impossible to get trade uh, workers around to your house these days because they are so busy on at the moment. The uh, WA government also extended the moratorium on residential tenancy evictions and rent increases in March to March 2021. So that will cause some pain for um, landlords in those sectors. Uh, the West Australian government has also um, introduced a $3 million incentive to um, uh, encourage WA residents to move to regional areas to help with the anticipated 50% staff shortfalls uh, in agriculture, especially in the Kimberley region and in fisheries at the forthcoming harvest season. So for those industries that, that have had minimal impact, obviously mining has, has done very well. Tourism around, local tourism around Perth is doing well. Construction is doing well. Agriculture is doing well, subject to labour. On the other side of it, on the negative impact side, uh, the regional tourism operators in the north of the state that have relied on international tourism significantly are really having a, having a hard time. Agriculture, those, those sectors in the agricultural sector that rely on uh, imported labour uh, are going to, are facing a real risk at harvest time. It, international education, as, as spoken about before, and transport have all been affected. Uh, so, but otherwise, as, as I said, the WA economy has been fairly resilient. Uh, through this COVID uh, time, and it's looking positive at the moment. We just don't know when uh, our Premier will let us leave the state or let anyone else in. And with that, Brent, I'll pass it back to you in Melbourne. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Um, 
we're at the end of our presentation today. Um, thank you for everyone's attendance. Um, we had 450 plus um, subscribers for today's uh, um, webinar, and, and I thank you for everyone um, from around the world that uh, is that have attended today. Um, if you've missed the presentation, or if you want to, um, um, if you've come in halfway, it will be on Rogers Ready's YouTube account, and that will go live um, this afternoon. Um, in addition, on our website, um, there will be the main points that will be summarised. Um, that will be summarised into a package and that, that will be on our website and that will be split by the jurisdictions. Um, thank you very much. If you have any um, requests, any inquiries, please feel free to contact your respective Rogers Ready um, officers or your BTG Global Advisory officers. Please stay safe and thank you for your attendance today.